going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Zoobox Goes to the Movies, except, uh, I don't know, streaming edition, another quarantine edition. Not a lot of movies out in the theaters to go see, so Zoobox has had to pivot. Now we talk about television. Everything is topsy-turvy. 2020, huh? I'm coming to you live from prison. <laughs> Keith <laughs> Renier. <laughs> It's really crazy how your glasses are exactly like his glasses, and you not do quite. have this. He's a little, not, he's a little not, round. Let me pull. Oh, the picture bit. I have doesn't mm-hmm. have. I oh, say so the picture I have doesn't have glasses. His mugshot doesn't have glasses. So sorry. Well, I mean, but your hair does look like volleyball gym keys. So good job. Yeah. So if that didn't clue you in today, everybody, we're going to be talking about both of the Nexium documentaries that came out this year one is called the vow it was on hbo um and the other one is called seduced inside the nexium cult and they both kind of have different focuses and different tones but deal with mostly the same people um and it's we're going to go and kind of compare and contrast and talk about just kind of the nature of weirdos and cults and get into a little bit of history of uh, mr ranieri himself Uh, maybe even beyond what they told you in the documentaries. We're going to talk about whether or not these are successful attempts at making a documentary about this. I think we have some thoughts on that. Yeah. So that'll be fun. And, uh, but yeah, there's a, there's in the vow, Keith Raniere, there's like a bunch of footage of him in gyms, a lot of volleyball, a lot of white guy stuff, you know, it's like volleyball, Basketball. I think they did like three legged races during their like retreat weekends. It looked oh, like yeah. potato sack races. <laughs> Listen, do you want to build camaraderie or not? Okay. What's more, what, what builds, I mean, do you think they did those when they like tie their legs together? That's a three legged three legged race. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. Because you have, yeah, tying them together makes one leg. I, I only heard when you said potato sack. Mm-hmm. Which is a different thing. <laughs> Which is a different <laughs> altogether. It is. The first thing I said was three legged race. Um, but yeah, so we watched them and we'll tell you what we thought. So do you have any do you want to talk about anything before we just start talking about the shows or uh, I mean, not in particular. I mean I think as we talk about the shows and everything, we'll probably some stuff will come up, you know, but we should probably just start from there. All right, let's just dive in. So uh if people don't know what Nexium is uh, if I can bring it up here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nexium is a self-proclaimed American multi-level marketing company. Company. <laughs> yeah, that's how it's like listed everywhere. It's a multi-level marketing company. Yeah. Which is interesting. And they... Um, where is it? Okay, based in Clifton Park, New York, a suburb of Albany, which has offered personal and professional development seminars through its executive success programs of large group awareness training. The company had been widely described as a cult and was shown in court to have been a recruiting platform for a secret society called DOS, in which women were branded and forced into sexual slavery. Um, and then in, and then it goes on to what we're going to talk about. But yeah, it's kind of, it was a weird corporate, like business world thing. It was one of these self-help things, basically. Yeah, which is like big. Uh, when so when did Nexium start? Was it probably the what early two thousands, late nineties? I think yeah. Uh, I mean, he so, had other ventures before that, but yeah, ne- he had he had kind of failed failed attempts at this that were much more like corporate seminar based rather mm-hmm. than being uh, the guru stuff, like the Tony Robbins stuff, right. The, you know, they, that's kind of what Nexium became, and then it becomes much more of a community, I guess you could call it. Um, that's very kind of you. <laughs> you know, grifted on rich people, basically. Like, you have to be, it's kind of like, it's structured a lot like Scientology. There's mm-hmm. all these different tiers, and you have to pay X amount of dollars to get into the next tier to get to your next training. And basically, everybody hopes that they get to become a. Uh, what would you call it? Like a like a cleared individual on different levels, and like with yeah. Nexium, they have like sashes, so you have different privileges and responsibilities based on like your sash level. Yeah, which is meant to like that. meant to give you a sense of personal investment in the yeah. collective, right? Because mm-hmm. it is almost like a form of control to get you to want to get to the next part, to be closer 
to Keith Raniere himself, I think that's the goal for a lot of people, is to become a direct acolyte of Keith Raniere, not just somebody that sees him from afar at a seminar, but somebody that actually like is uh, mentored by him, I suppose. It kind of seems like the goal for most people, and depending on how wealthy you were, basically, <laughs> or how uh, how hot you were, if you're a chick. Well, I yeah, but I think the I think that the the money thing came not just money though. I think ah <laughs> no, not just the the money thing, but also just kind of like your um at least at the beginning for, I gathered from the documentaries was like your prevalence in society as in like uh recogn like how recognizable you were so like yeah. you would shoot for celebrity even if they weren't these like massive a-listers like you know like scientology is like chock full of them this is like the b tier you know? <laughs> yeah these are like the kind cw the cw players or the sci-fi like there's people from uh battlestar galactica yeah, it's all of battlestar galactica <laughs> well there's all there's one of them the woman who played callie um which I can't remember her name off the top of my head. There's actually an interesting. She did an interview like a couple weeks ago with Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert. Which I I wish I would have watched that I, before we did this. I didn't not, watch. Not that. not that interesting, honestly. Still spewing the same thing. Yeah, kind of like the same log line from that uh, India Oxenberg gave when she was talking about her experience with in the documentary Seduced, mm-hmm. available now on Stars. Um, so yeah, so we watched the first. The first one we watched was the Vow. Uh, that mm-hmm. one was, was the first one that premiered. Um, I didn't really know. I knew of this story, but I didn't know a ton about it, like in detail. Like I just knew about Keith Raniere as kind of like this weird, shadowy figure. I knew that he had gotten arrested. I knew that Allison Mack, actress of a uh, Smallville fame, that's where I knew her from. I actually grew up watching Smallville, so I was like, oh, that's weird. It's like a yeah, weird... I've never seen I've never seen Smallville. No, it's not worth watching, but <laughs> <laughs> not now. I mean, if you were like 15, I'd be like, yeah, check out Smallville. The, but, the uh, only thing I knew of it was the bar I live right next to and like one of the favorite bartenders there, he looked just like Lex Luthor from that show, so the joke the running joke every Halloween was he was just Lex Luthor from Smallville. So he wouldn't even really like dress up. It was pretty funny. Michael <laughs> Rosenbaum. Yeah. yeah, he looked just like him. Yeah. Um, so I guess just in general, mm-hmm. before we get into the details, like, did you think that this documentary was effective in teaching you about Nexium, the experiences of the people in Nexium, and uh, yeah, what was your um, kind of overall general feel of it? Uh, I think we we agree on this. It was too long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think because it was a little too long, it kind of watered down a lot of impactful things because instead of giving you like, um, not saying that this should be like something that is sensational to the point where it's just punch after punch after punch, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be that, but you would get to that point where something intriguing was being discovered or laid out. And then it kind of just like washed away into something a little less ex- not even just extreme but in my mind important well it's a weird so, thing because of because of the nature of the show like the vow is set up to be a testimonial for these women mostly the women but also yeah. a few of the, a few of the men that were involved and it's it is much more just about them and their dealing with their trauma right so it doesn't right. even get into a ton of like kind of the life of being inside nexium it's really more about the fallout uh what i th- but yeah. i mean because you did sorry Oh, so you do get a little bit of that, though, because, like, you do... You do, of course, Because yeah. I think the interesting thing I did get from the Val that was cool was because you do see the side of the women, but also, like, their husbands and spouses. And you do see kind of, like, what a mar- for a married couple, it was like that discovering yeah. that that was going on with your wife. But then also, wasn't the couple the main director, the What the Bleep Do We Know guy... Weren't they yeah. separated at one point and then they get back together? Uh, Mark Vic- Vic- Vicente, Vicente and Bonnie yeah, Vic- Peace. Uh, yeah, didn't they? One of them was out, one was still in, and they weren't sure, and then they decided yeah, that they'd uh, get out together. Yeah, Bonnie is the first one that left because she was introduced to DOS, freaked her out. And, um, Which, rightfully so. <laughs> rightfully so, right? Uh, yeah, but the thing, of because it gives kind of all of these people their due in a certain respect. So the first half of the documentary, the series, is front-loaded with the major players that you spend most of the documentary with. Yeah. And you get to learn about their experience with Nexium, how they got involved, how they started to kind of come to terms with the fact that they're involved in something that's like manipulative and gross. 
And then it goes back into the past uh, to some women that this had already happened with Keith, right? Mm -hmm. Some of these, some of the women that they, the major players, had actually attacked in public uh, in the past, right? But what that did was it created a redundancy because their stories are exactly the same. Right. So you just heard the same story over and over again, and what it had this weird effect of normalizing the behavior in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, it stopped being shocking. Because once right. you say you once you say ten times, this awful thing happened. It almost normalizes it, and you're just like, "All right, get on with it." Which ends up being this kind of counterproductive thing. And it's not right. like we didn't binge the show or anything. We watched it week to week. To week, yep. Um, that beautiful thought, with that beautiful theme song. Beautiful theme song. Which I <laughs> thought it was just a. There was not enough information in each episode, and they would really drag it out. Yeah, no, 100%. This like, is just this is just a trend with I think true crime shows on any streaming service. They're all two or three episodes too long. Mhm. Mm you know, even me as like a fan of these kinds of things, like watching true crime shows and true crime documentary series like and documentaries. It was just it's just too much and then you kind of get lost in the weeds too much. There was no focus to it. And then Till kind of towards the end, the last few episodes, it gets more narrow again. But but even then, you're just still kind of like to me, it was like you're left. You're left. There's a lot still wanted, right? Like because I feel like you were shown the main highlight and crazy points, but that's where it kind of stopped. And there's all these subtleties within that group that are even more disturbing or tell more about know what it is and for me it was just like when you hit these major points you do get that moment of shock and like yeah this is awful but then like you said it's so repetitive that you're just like okay yeah there, it's like a number and i know that, that sounds like yeah. you said it sounds terrible but because what happened in that group it's terrible no but, obviously yeah and it's because like, it got to the point of like child sex trafficking at one point you're like which which, which is they it, didn't talk about a ton in the vow the vow does not really get into um there no. is tons of sensationalistic things that the vow does not really touch on. I think from a creative standpoint, I understood why they did that because it's supposed to be kind of taking back their power type of story yeah. and about liberation and uh, I guess in some sort of weird broad way like this fight against the patriarchy because they're not only fighting Keith Raniere, they're fighting society paying attention to their story and getting this sto this newspaper this this yeah. uh, article published and uh, interest of the public and stuff like that. So that's also an aspect of the story. But yeah, it's not also just being branded as like dumb women blindly just leading into this thing, you know. Um, yeah, and they they basically end up. Oh my goodness, alert! Um, they they basically end up riding the Me Too wave to get yep. their story out there. That's something that. Yeah, when they yeah tagged on to that. I mean, which, I mean, I, I guess in a sense it was good because it did help, you know, kind of get it a little more noticed and out there, but I don't there know. Is, but there is something, I think, in the construction of The Vow that's a little too TV-ish. It's, like, too – it's very cynical. Like, the cliffhanger is constantly – even the last episode is a cliffhanger, like – where they're yeah. <laughs> they talking <laughs> to Keith Raniere from prison. He's like, you don't know the whole story, y'all. <laughs> like some That's weird... That's not what he sounds like. Oh, I know that. Oh, guys, uh... he's like, that was he's another like... problem with like every time Keith Raniere's face would pop up on the screen for a clip, I kind of laugh because you're just like, this dude? Really? <laughs> like, this dude? Maybe, maybe he's really good at what he does, you know? Yeah, his his history shows Dude that. Likes once we fuck. get into that, mm, once we get into that, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think just the quality of the there is kind of just a cynical. It kind of leave, left a bad taste on my mouth because I feel like you could have done the this whole story in one season. Like you could have, I, I think. I do kind of like though that they left it that they're going to talk to Keith. No, I wish they had talked to Keith in the first season. Well, I understand. Well, I understand why they didn't, because they're focusing on the women, and to give Keith a platform amongst them trying to take their power back and, and deal with the trauma it's might be seen they as... realized the only way they could get interest in a second season of this. <laughs> well, no, that's what I'm saying about the yeah. cynical aspect of it. It's became, it's, now it's a product. Now these are celebrities. They're celebrities now because they were in Nexium. Now they're all over, you know, getting interviewed everywhere. They're on podcasts. I see them pop up all over the place. Like, oh, like, really? Sarah Edmondson, 
uh, she was a kind of a C she's level the, actress. Wasn't she the first one to speak about the brand publicly, though? In the yeah, sense no, of she's like, yeah, she's the one and showing it. Yeah, the, her pictures in the story and stuff like that. You know, that. I wish they would have talked to. There is a lady they meet. She was involved with Keith, and um, she has all these like notes that she's like keeping in her house because she still kind of lives in the area that this took place. You know what I'm talking about? And they go in the basement, and she has these, like, drawing charts of paper, almost kind of like a beautiful mind going on in the room. <laughs> or I think of, like, um, in It's Always Sunny, where they're trying to f- figure out, <laughs> um, you know, Charlie Day's figuring out the guy. Yes, yeah. But anyway. Um, Pepe Silva. Yeah, Pepe Silva. <laughs> no, but it's, to me, that's really interesting, because it shows how long some of this stuff was, like, being documented and going on. And then, like, what did it take? I mean, was it the branding that was actually the, you know, but well, I don't feel like they spent enough time with someone like that where she, you get little blips of her reading like letters and getting these like clips and stuff in, in, in the vow. We can talk about this in a different way with the other documentary, but I feel like that would have added so much more because it, it's weird. I don't know. I know they're focusing on the women, but you only hear Keith talking to another man in the cult. And I feel like that lady could have given a more of like, direct contact and conversation with the women if that's what we're focusing on. I think, yeah, I think the vow assumes that you know more than you do going in, and there isn't a lot of contextualization. So when you're talking about what that lady does, is she adds this kind of context to who he was when he was younger, and how he came about, and the kind of things he would say and do. Um, You don't, like, Keith is a cartoon villain. Yes. Like, I'm not saying he's a good person, but I guarantee you there's more to Keith Raniere than... I mean, with a person that has that kind of conviction and accomplished what he accomplished in some sort of weird backwards compliment. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can bring up a few things. I actually, because I was like, I had a little, like, during my lunch break today, did a little research on him. And this is just basic Wikipedia stuff, but it was interesting because it was stuff... That does speak to a lot of the things that happen, especially what you find out in that second documentary, which we can talk about. So I'm going to highlight. So he was 24, and he had sex with a 15-year-old after they met in a theater group. And then it was introduced to another friend of hers who's also 15. And when the first 15-year-old broke it off, he went with the other 15-year-old. And then... Her older sister caught him climbing into her bedroom window, and that's how they got caught. And when he was confronted, he claimed that, and this is a quote, that Gina, who is the 15-year-old, was a Buddhist goddess that was meant to be with him. Was his, like... <laughs> yeah, so he always had kind that of kind thing. of... Uh... But then, so what happened was she dropped out of school, and then... Um, she worked at the consumer's byline, which was his first company, that first like business mm-hmm. marketing company. And on October 11th of 2002, she was found dead of a gunshot wound to her head on the grounds of a Buddhist monastery in New York. Goodness gracious. The covering kind of for Keith Raniere. I, well, I mean, I know, but that's just like, you know, she was a Buddhist goddess. Oh, I think she like... She's fucking 15, he's 24. Well, she was a Buddhist goddess. That's, she's <laughs> ageless. Right? <laughs> no, obviously, because no, he's always... Yeah, he's always used these... Obviously, he has a history of using these kind of angles of, like, mixing the mental with the spiritual and... Yeah, to, which, to manipulate people, ultimately, which is... It's, the oddest thing about it is that it just becomes this big thing for like sexual dominance. That's the kind yeah. of, it all circles around that. And that's ends up being what Das is. That ends up being like his focus towards the end of this journey. This trajectory is that it's not even the, the rest of his system, right? The technologies yeah. that they develop, they call them technologies, which is just basically the form of hypnotism and self-help kind of pablum. It's the just normal self-help stuff. Also, and then he mixes in there, these kind of weird, uh, tugging at people's moral fibers yeah. in terms of the things that they will accept another person will do or w- will be done to them. He's always kind of sprinkling these things in there because like when he's talking about like, well, you know, like things like rape are relative. It's, it becomes relative. Like how can you really yeah. judge somebody? What if that person's just primal? Like, What, what if, if I find just... an attractive baby? He actually said that at one no, point. Yeah, it's like, if... 
Which I would like <laughs> to see the full context of that because they show that quite a few times and they never show more than like a 20 second clip. It's just showing, I think he is saying all these shocking things obviously to cover ground like we're saying, but it's just like, but there are those weird things he throws it out there to like, those are things he's probably actually doing maybe. I, was like, well, I don't know if he's having <laughs> sex with babies. Uh, no, well, we, as you find <laughs> out more in the other documentary, Seduced, is that there's a there's a kind of a swingers vibe to Nexium, or there and there always was even mm-hmm. before DOS started. And I think what he wants you to do is let go of your inhibitions. Like, that's the whole thing, like pushing your boundaries, uh, kind of decontextualizing and deconstructing the notions of monogamy. And what is sex? Like, what does it actually even mean? Does it actually mean anything? Like, that's like, and he's trying to plant those seeds in people's heads, basically to run like a swingers commune. Yeah, no, 100%. But can I, it's just to back up, this will feed into what we're talking about. So he actually... Sure. So what he actually credits his Nexium work to, or where the idea came from, so he brags that at the age of 12, he read, um, it's a three-book series called The Foundation Series by Isaac Asimov. Yeah, I know, yeah I know it. Yeah. yeah, so that's what he credits, and it's actually more of Second Foundation is what he read at 12, that the, which is the second book in the series. And he credits a lot of his ideas and everything coming from reading this work at such an early age and he talks in, in depth about that a lot I'd about like to re- this, which is like so i think the th- i've I, i've read some asthma asthma i always have a hard time saying his name asthma. isaac yeah um i i've read a few of his things i've never read this particular series so i looked into it and it's a it's really about a secret society and it like focuses sorry i took some notes but what it really focuses is on is uh, kind of like a um it's a budding colony of psychologists and mentalics uh and people with telepathic abilities located at star's end and then there's a bunch of like layers to it that peel back it becomes like this other thing Uh, but you never really find out what it actually is until like the third book but it's actually this this gathering and colony of uh, mind control yes yeah it's Which all, is it's, exactly it's, like you were saying. Become Nexium became this like living community, you know. So yeah, that has all these secretive layers, and nobody right. really knows what the other layer is doing and how so deep I, it goes or who's involved in what. Right. So uh, when I everybody's read everybody's watching today, each other. Yeah. I mean, I've read the first Foundation. I've always wanted to finish the series. I just never have. Well, but, you should, uh, and then I figure out how to start a colony, right? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, it's I just found that terrible, really interesting because hit for Ranieri, he likes to boast about being like the world's smartest man and all these things. And he found he's he's not necessarily in the like academic and that intellectual sense. He did kind of become a very smart person of manipulation and psychology wise. Yeah, he's like a mentalist. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> honestly, well, that's what that's what you would call it. It's yeah, I, I mean, mean that's, that's it's, his... just, it's just manipulating people and mind mind control through manipulation. Well, and that's what the the co-founder yes. Sal was her last name Salzman, Nancy Salzman. Yeah, well, she's yeah, well, yeah. She's the well, co-founder. Technically, uh, she's yeah. Credited as the co-founder. Um, she's that's what she's yeah, yeah. She specialized in a form of psychology that used tone and like the way you speak to people to control them. Yeah, it's about suggestion. It's yeah. about it's all these things that uh, the hu- human beings up. naturally, implicitly respond to in certain ways. And once you understand how to control that, you can yeah. get people to kind of believe you. Uh, they'll trust you. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what the, all the being, what is it? They call it being an auditor. Like when you would go out and you do like these seminars and classes with new Nexian yeah. people. And stuff, right? yeah, they yeah. all become those things. That's what they're doing. They bring them up in front of everybody and they do certain hand gestures and they touch people in certain ways and use certain tones of voice and use certain keywords that they know that especially vulnerable lost people uh, will respond to, you know? Yep. I mean, that's that's very common with groups like this. I mean... Well, it's no different like if you go to see like a psychic, right? You go see yeah. a fucking... What's his name? What's the, Who's that famous psychic? There's he, used a couple. Have a sh- ha- he used to have a show on the Sci-Fi channel. Are you talking about the guy from South America? No, he had a bunch of books. He had a TV show on sci-fi. Like it was, he was all over the place in the late '90s, early 2000s. What are you talking it's the about? Same name as a fucking politician. I don't remember, but people out there probably know. Uh, but anyways, but that's what you do when you do cold readings. 
Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I mean, I have some personal things we can talk about. We should probably talk about the second documentary, but I, I have personal experience with something like this. We could. I wanted to talk about kind of why we picked this, I think. But it's totally there, and it's it's crazy how it happens, you know, and yeah. how effective it can be. So, I don't know. You want to talk about the second documentary first, then we'll get into the juicy bits? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, the second one is called Seduced, Inside the Nexium Cult. This one uh, is described as seduce. Seduced follows India Oxenberg's abuse and her own culpability inside the Nexium Cult, an organization marketed as a self-help group. Now, India Oxenberg is the daughter of, uh, what's her name? She's a dynasty uh, actress. Catherine Oxenberg, who is a major fixture in The Vow. And she, in The Vow, chronicles her trying to get her daughter out. That's why she's involved in this. That's why she's trying to do what she's mm -hmm. doing. She's trying to get her daughter out of the cult. And so yeah. this one is post-India leaving Nexium, and it's kind of a retrospective for her. Um, it's only four episodes. Thankfully, it's very tight. It's yes. much more sensationalistic, but it also comes off as as an attempt to. Uh, I felt more educated. I felt like I learned more about actually how Nexium functioned. Well, and, I, and I also did. You learn so the way you see is Catherine's the mom, right? The way yeah. you see her in the vow is you just see the frantic side of the mother trying to get her daughter back and doing her press tour. But then what you discover through their documentary is she's actually the reason the daughter ended up in Nexium. And Which they talk about. They do talk about that. Not that much, though, but it was in such an impactful way in that one where you could kind of see... I mean, of course you're upset that your child's entangled with something like this, but you could see more why she's more fervent and stuff. I, I, I don't know. I just sure. felt more educated well, I, from their yeah. documentary than I did The Vow. I, th I think Seduced has the benefit of being about one person. So there mm. is like this, this narrative through line that you can follow. It has a chronological order. It's linear in terms of like when they touch on things. You just kind of follow her experience. And then you get talking heads and people contextualizing things in different ways, giving you background information on Nexium. Um, uh, India obviously is in the documentary. She does a bunch of like, kind of like sit down talking head interviews, a lot of which seem scripted. Um, yeah, which I didn't agree with you on that. I don't know how. And think, they might they might I have been just because it's hard for her to talk about. I don't know, but I no, didn't. They didn't no, feel that way to me. Well, because this is not like a documentary in the sense the way The Vow was. The Vow was like they were filming these people as this shit is happening. They're getting real reactions, et cetera, et cetera. This is like a, I want to make a documentary about a historical event. And I can go and craft the narrative beforehand. Like I can structure it. So it has a much more solid structure. Um, and I think, I think her interviews are, I think a lot of them are scripted. And I, but okay. I don't. I'm not saying that as necessarily a negative, because there are times where there's she breaks, she can't, you know, she breaks down, right? She cries, whatever. And I'm not saying those things are premeditated. I think it just makes it easier to get out the information you have to get out. Like they wanted this to obviously be in, like informal and succinct. Yeah, no, that and makes like, sense. So you have to kind of organize things that way, because it is just, it is just a different beast than the vow. It has completely different aims. And I think they have the benefit of it just being about India. And they're not like following this moment to moment story that was developing as the vow was. I mean, the vow right. is much more like a fly on the wall type. Yeah. In the moment. Stuff. Yeah. I did appreciate too, the way with uh, the India documentary, it was more linear. Yeah. No, yeah. it's it's easier to track. You can yeah. have emo you can invest emotionally in something because it's not so all over the place and taking you to the present, taking you. Oh, let's talk about what happened five years ago. Let's talk about what's happening now. Like that's the vow is kind of all over the place that way. And, and you I, do I don't know if there's a way around that though. And the, I know, but you also like in the India one, you do find a little bit more of that like nitty gritty, like those things about like the sex Good trafficking stuff. and people being like locked into houses and rooms, you know, which. You know, to me, from the vow, the the branding's enough and learning, like, what it took for people to get to that limit. But even in the India one, at the end, they show how these people are trying to, like, heal and get past that and, like, not just be like, I'm India from Nexium or I'm this person from Nexium. So to me, that felt more um, liberating or more towards the release of the DOS women than the vow did because it was showing that they're going through a process of like 
what this association is actually like, but also even India trying to like remove her brand. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, you saw things like that, that were very, yeah. you've gotten into more detail about like the actual branding process because India was actually on like the cusp of development of it. She was one of the first, wasn't she? I think so. I mean, yeah, India's, because of in, Ali India, Mack. Yeah. <laughs> in, India, because of her relationship with Allison Mack, seems like she was kind of a little bit closer and probably had actually had more intense experiences. I think she was a little deeper in. Yeah. Uh, especially when it came with the sexual stuff with Keith Raniere. I don't think everybody had to do that. I don't think that was something everybody did. At least it doesn't seem like it. Like the, a lot of the women in the vow, I don't think that happened with them. They had to, they had to, they were in DOS and they had to provide each other collateral. And they all knew that Keith was seeing the pictures and the stories and the texts, but they didn't like have to was... go seduce Keith Raniere. But no, but I think it, so I think it'd be fair for us to stop right now and kind of go more into what DOS became. So DOS became this tiered level of slaves and dominance. Well, so you the, had like at, masters at you had to report to and yeah. Sure. At the beginning though, the reason mm -hmm. why DOS is created is mm -hmm. because there is like a men's only version of Nexium. Right. They, they have their own men's only retreat where they talk about drinking and farting and jerking off or whatever. Yeah, and what, what what it is to be like sensitive as a man or not sensitive. Well, that, yeah, that's actually a big part of Nexium is a little bit of this uh, this idea this this battle against misandry. Yeah, uh, it's like uh, Keith Raniere. I guess his mom hurt his feelings or something. Probably she was uh, an alcoholic. I read today. Yeah, um, yeah. He, like, he has he has a chip on his shoulder about how young men are treated by society, which you know probably not all of the things I would disagree with. But, like, obviously you it's, don't go to do this, but... <laughs> uh, no, I was just getting ready to say, should I not sleep here tonight? Like, uh... Hold on. <laughs> headband back on. Um, no, but, I mean, like, so it starts with those kind of things, and then, you know, you get, and then the men get into it, they're like, yeah, that is fucked up. You know, that's, well, that is fucked yeah, up. Yeah, what the hell, man? And then it wants Rough. to recontextualize <laughs> the idea of femininity um, as to be, like, for equity reasons, it's actually very like woke progressive stuff because they're saying like women need to accept like this. Uh, because he's not, they're not advocating for maternalism, they're not advocating like you'd be a traditional woman. No, they're not. They're saying like if you want to be in a man's world, you're gonna have to fucking deal with it. Like that's the kind of thing. Right. And then DOS starts as a support system for women to empower and better themselves and to have a community and have peers. And uh, and have their own kind of strand of teaching. And then that's not what it is. <laughs> no, that's not what it ends up being. It ends up yeah. just being like uh, Sarah said. It's very like control based. There's there's slaves and masters, and they have to well, give each give dirt about kind of like in the way Scientologists Scientologists do when they go. They know into, everything. Uh, yeah. They know all your dirty secrets, and they tape record it, and they keep it. Yeah, they call it collateral, and then every week they have to, like, provide more and more collateral, and then it even gets to the point where they're, like, have to make shit up, but it's, like, documented. So it's, like, I will say something from the vow is, like, uh, the main lady, Sarah, right? Uh, she at one point had to talk about how much she hated her husband and children and, like, just, like, dog them and, like, say crazy shit, but someone had that, and you didn't know where it went after your master. So yeah, it's, like, so a... Like yeah, a tree of things, right? They do not want to speak out or leave or whatever because you don't know what's going to happen right. with your or collateral. Deny them what they and a lot of do. and a lot yeah. of times it's not the things that they say were not true. There was so much pressure to constantly incriminate yourself in a weird way. Yeah, uh, you were always a pressured. <laughs> a lot of nudes, a lot of shit talking your family, saying mm -hmm. awful things about your kids, like you said. Doing uh, so, crazy things. And so yeah. they would ask, like, you know, what do I do? I just don't have anything to say. They're like, make shit up. Mm -hmm. Just make it up. It and just has had, to be uh, do, like, salacious. Yeah, and then you had to do, like, readiness checks, which once we get more into my personal stuff, I remember things like this. Yeah, it's weird. I So Sean and I have discovered I think I was in a political cult, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, juicy, guys. Um, but anyway... No, or these people, like, at any hour, you had to respond. If you didn't respond, you were given, like, penance and punishment. Mm -hmm. Or, like, if you did something wrong, like, towards your spouse, you had to, like, sleep on the floor because you were, like, serving your penance. And, like, well, it, not, no, it wasn't about your spouse. It was just about not the readiness checks because uh, they have a moment. No, I'm just saying it just became to that where if you didn't respond or do what was asked of you, like, even, like, calorie counting, 
and like yeah. getting to weights and stuff. You had to do things like sleep on the floor or do Listen, like either you planks. do or you don't. You know what I mean? <laughs> or you know, you know, do like the the dead stands against the wall for four minutes, but show proof of it, or like go outside and walk in the snow for an hour and like show proof of it. And it's like what? Like yeah. What? <laughs> So it took that, like, kind of, um, it was readying people that were coming from that zone of, like, soft, controlled speak, readying them to get into this world of just, like, being asked to do the craziest shit, you know? And it's just, like, I wonder where it really would have gone if it hadn't have broke. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what was the end game goal? I don't really know. I don't know Besides either. Besides getting laid. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah, because it doesn't seem like a very sustainable thing. Like, at no. some point, you, cause, because it, it's, it's the hubris. It's hubris. Like, it's got, he got greedy. It's like greed. It's just like, now there's too many people involved. Maybe you could get away with this if it was like five or six people. But right. when, you're trying to just, when you're trying to constantly, like, increase so the size of... memory when it's five or six people. Come on. Well, there you go. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, then it's controllable. But, like, if you're trying to, like increase the size of your harem constantly like it's unwieldy well and then he also too got to the point where he got the what was it the seagram's heiresses that was er, that was er, very early i mean that's early in the beginning of nexium they basically uh, bankrolled the whole thing right which is so any seagram's alcohol you all drink like so if you drink seagram's you are supporting these people but anyway Sick. Yeah, and that's crazy because then he had these like mousy women, like just like millions and mil- hundreds of millions of dollars and houses and property and doing plays and singing songs to the vanguard because they called him Vanguard. Like, can we talk about that? Like, <laughs> yeah, well, Guru's got to have a name, dude. What would your Guru name be? Um, Papa. Ew. <laughs> Ew. Call me Papa. Ew. Call me Papa. Do don't it. say that ever again. Do it. Thank you. <laughs> As your um, wife, don't ever say that again. <laughs> I would no. be, I would be well, like, yeah, that was the cool thing about the seduced one is that you got a little bit more info about these summer retreats that basically revolved, which I don't even think the vow gets into, but they revolve around Keith Raniere's birthday. Yeah, no, they talked about it for like two minutes. Yeah. Was- this one showed you like what people would do and. Like, and songs and dances and yeah it was much more like personal uh and i think in, that is the nature of it being about india oxenberg seduced like i think it's just much more personal you learn more personal anecdotes about the people that were obsessed with keith ranieri and the types of yeah. people that uh can get taken in by this stuff which the vow kind of goes into a little bit because people feel regret they feel like how the fuck was i so stupid etc cetera, etc cetera. But there is kind of a distance to it in, in a different way. Because in the in yeah. Seduced, it felt much more immediate. Like when you learn about the types of people like Allison Mack. Right? You learn a lot about Allison Mack in Seduced. I mean, obviously, you learn, her you and also, were like best friends as well. Yeah. So. And you learn about like this kind of uh, actress stereotype that she kind of was. Really needy, sociopathic. Um, and she kind of found this, she found this focus. Mm-hmm. And that's all she cared about. And like she, like she was, they have this. She's like singing a song during one of these retreats, one of these birthday <laughs> I was parties. actually just getting ready to bring that up. And she's like, you know, basically trying to give an Academy Award-winning performance. Like it was secretly, and... it was secretly like a love song to Keith. It was and, not uh, so secret though, you know. If you knew, you knew. Yeah, if you knew, you knew. <laughs> Because she just uh, wanted to be with him so bad, so she wanted to weigh 102 pounds and just be with Keith. Well, it's crazy. Like, you know, this is not, like, this is somebody that had, like, a life and a career. hmm You know what I'm saying? Like, she was not the biggest actress in the world, but she would have had a steady working career in TV for the rest of her life. She would have. Like, she would have been a Kristen Bell. She was, uh, yeah, probably, you know, probably a little, a notch below Kristen Bell. She's not on network TV yet. You no, know, but you know what I mean. Network TV. And I actually think Kristen Bell's can be funny, but anyway, I'm just saying that's you the would. vibe. You would. Know. That's disgusting. You're disgusting. This is anyway. a disgusting <laughs> comment. I'm sorry, sir. Do you need more collateral for that? <laughs> I do. I do. Um, it's not funny. I'm sorry. We're probably going to get, like, so many mean comments. I'm, I'm... How could you make jokes? Well, actually, I think well, there was one thing, day. Listen, listen, there yeah. is an aspect to this where you have personal responsibility for the shit you involve yourself in. Yes. 
And yes. I th and they just prey on uh, vulnerable people at vulnerable moments in their life. Yep. And we see this culturally; it happens all the time. And we have a generation of people, especially I think our generation, it's like very displaced in terms of like what the what they want to do in the world and what what they think life is about and where their focus and direction should be. I mean, oh, that's I why somebody like Jordan Peterson was so popular. Jordan Peterson is a de facto guru in the sense that he is out there giving life advice. I, he yeah. makes people feel heard. And he you know, backs it by these uh, deep thoughts and thinkers as well as his own like work he has done. You know, So it's yeah. like very melding of the mind. Yeah. But, th but there's a version of Jordan Peterson that starts a cult. Like if he had just more selfish, nefarious it's his daughter intense, with her meat shit, you know? <laughs> but you can take that same formula the meat. because he is saying the same shit that every – like when I read – because I liked Jordan Peterson because I enjoy what he has to say about kind of the nature of philosophy and literature and how they complement each other and how – I just interject for a second. I've never read Jordan Peterson, so – No, I know. Sarah's never read Jordan Peterson, but I do – I like like that aspect of Jordan Peterson, how he contextualizes like religion and – uh, about how these kind of these stories have informed human humanity as something innate in us that we need to tell them. We need to give ourselves structure in life. I like well, all you that mean stuff. Nietzsche? He's just Nietzsche too. <laughs> well, he, lo he loves Nietzsche, but like everybody, for every generation, you need a you need a voice to re say those things again. Um, honestly, it's Keith Raniere. Honestly, well, what I'm saying is though, like when I read his book, that was like this giant international bestseller, Twelve Rules for Life, right? Yeah. I didn't. Was, I was like, eh, whatever. Like, this is just not the interest. It's just the basic self help stuff. I've heard this a million. My mom tells me this kind of shit. Clean your room, fucking get a haircut, make sure you take a shower every day. Like, don't. Is it really like that? Don't allow yourself to. Well, I'm being, you know, I'm being oh. uh, very broad. Here, I was gonna but, be like, wow. <laughs> but the but the 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 foundation of it is that. I mean, he's mm. gonna go deeper into it. But the foundation are these very basic, simple things about like how to fight off depression, how to find purpose in your life. Well, it's, yeah, it, it, it's self care to become the best version of yourself. And that's but what is the difference between that and what Nexium starts as? Like that is what Keith Raniere is preaching: be your best yeah. self. Mm -hmm. Be the best you. And well, I'm going to give you the tools to achieve that. And to be fair, that is a ton of philosophy. And that's actually how I got that is, where that, I was. <laughs> that is, but that is what philosophy is. Because philosophy yeah. is, I know Sarah and I kind of maybe quibble on this definition, but it's about finding the bottom of the truth. Find the base of it. Like what is the ground floor <laughs> of, no, that is what philosophy is looking for. It is trying to find what is true. Maybe that's an ideal. Maybe it's an abstraction that can never actually be found. But the pursuit see, is that. See, truth don't be don't be a gross postmodernist. You're about no, to get in your truth, gross Foucault no, bullshit. No, I I am not. No, you shut up. You're misrepresenting me right now. No, I'm not. I've had plenty of late night conversations <laughs> with Sarah. We argue. No, <laughs> which is a healthy thing. Let's we go to bed mad, three thirty in the morning, flicking cigarettes out in the yard, being like, "You fucking dummy." That's what she <laughs> says to me. Go fuck yourself. Like, oh, um, I'm sorry. Did you read? No, see, for me, all these see, for books? me, it does because <laughs> I only wasted four years of my fucking life. <laughs> no, um, you to read no, a Wikipedia article and come talk to me. <laughs> uh, no, see, for me, it's like I, I, I don't want to focus on the word truth. For me, it's understanding. That's because truth and understanding are different things. What are you, my brother Dan? Probably. Dan and I probably get along if we'd actually talk for any sort of length of time. <laughs> over semantics over here. Love no, you, Dan. I, no, I understand. <laughs> no okay. that's, that's to me. It, to me, it is a love of the pursuit of understanding. And that, to me, is what knowledge is. Um, because there is no, like, uh, truth either way. Anyway, this is a whole... We're getting off the rails on a Yeah, crazy but colloquially, trip. you could just, you just call it truth. No. No, because there's a specific yeah. meaning to truth. There are things that are true, and there are things that are not. Mm -mm. There's metaphorical truths. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk after this. No, yeah, we, okay. <laughs> See, this is the podcast you need to be doing with me. <laughs> probably. Just argue with you about semantics for 90 minutes a week. And philosophy? Great. Let's do it. Do sure. it. Let's do it. <laughs> Handshake. No. <laughs> we'll find the day we don't have our son. <laughs> and we'll yeah, do pretty that. much. Um, but I like things other than that. <laughs> no, um, where are we going with this? No, what, so what we were saying is kind of you can understand how people can get caught up. Oh, not really understand like how things can escalate because it's all so incremental and it just happens. 
but there is still you are kind of responsible a little bit for yourself. Yes. Yes. And I think 100%. the fact that people can get out of it is a testament that yeah, you are responsible. Like I mean, because cool. you, you can come to this realization. Yeah, I mean, so this might be a good segue to talk about my life. <laughs> Yeah, so you can go into, you can present that how you'd like to present that. Yeah, I mean, and of course, give me feedback, but I do have to like kind of like see. I'm still in it. I can't, I can't say specifics a ton. I don't uh, know why. Honestly, I don't. Uh just because. No, I'm just. I, Keith okay. Mary, show up at my door. No, um, no. I'm sorry, I, <laughs> no. So anyway, so when I met Sean. I, so I had, I had a really good teaching career and then I had gotten an opportunity at a law firm and I was the receptionist and cross training as a paralegal, which I probably dumbest mistake in my life. <laughs> like I should have just stuck with that a little bit longer because it was free paralegal training, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which I'd be good at. But anyway, um, it was right after college. Uh, I had a ton of friends, made a lot of friends. I went to a very, um, liberal liberal arts school um it's one of the best schools in my state i can say my school name i went to goucher college uh very proud of all that i accomplished there like uh I've been published a couple times spoke at conferences but through that i met a lot of like uh lofty thoughty people obviously communists yeah, yeah but it was divided eventually like l let me not let me just say that because i'm not a communist well back then they didn't call themselves communists now they do but when we were that age they weren't nobody was out there being like i'm a fucking no, they're radicals yeah they're what, radicals they're what, 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 what have i always told you about myself i'm more radical than the radicals because i think the way i want to fucking think <laughs> you know i don't really stick to labels or anything like that really when it comes to you know i, I don't mean to be boring i'm just giving backstory to where i ended up mm -hmm. yeah i don't uh ascribe to that kind of stuff because i might feel more conservative about like uh economics probably and I'm more socially liberal, you know, so I, I am like kind of libertarian. Sure. But I don't really like ascribing to terms. I just feel how I fucking want to feel. And that's more radical than the radicals. Because uh, they're more indoctrinated than a lot of people. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, so we were all hanging out doing our normal, normal college thing, partying. And then um, my, my roommate was my, my best friend that I had met in college. Uh, great girl. And she'd respond to like an internship ad that she had seen on um in uh actually it was indeed and uh it was a summer internship about social organization which her major in college this is what used to kill me her major was peace studies <laughs> there you go um uh, but she was more geared when i first like met her it was more towards like uh, social work you yeah. know and more yeah. mediation i guess would have been the better term for that um degree like mediation studies um sorry the cat uh but anyway so she came more and more into this like group of people but then like so what happened was you know she would go she went for the interview and i remember she was at the coffee shop across the street and then they met with her again and they met with her again and then one day she said i got cleared and i'm like you got cleared okay you got the you got the job got the internship i didn't think of it in those terms but seeing things like this nexium documentary is when Terms like that become stick out my head more, and it kind of like I hate sure, these words. Sure, but you need to you need to say what it is. Like you have not even said what it is she's doing. I'm building up to that. No, so what they said is is they just advertise as community organizing to, uh, like okay. help socially, right, or yeah. economically, and yeah, that's all the advertisement was. Is very, but she was like, oh, I can be a community organizer, great. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was an internship that potentially led to a paid job, and then come to find out what it is is. It is, it was a union, it's a union, and they were hiring on people to help, well, what they tell you at first is you are there to help improve the conditions of your city and jobs in your city. It's like an activist nonprofit group, right? Yeah. Yeah. Under the, under the, under the guys, under the, 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 and they basically lie. And so when their indeed thing is full of shit to attract mm -hmm. well-meaning people. But I think that's why it's important to phrase it that way and kind of give that build up. I'm trying to reveal. I'm trying to get my documentary, Sean. Like, come on. We need that money. No, and so for years, I I was, you know, I'm a friendly person. I'm an affable person. I'm very open to meeting all sorts of people. So other interns and then, you know, 
not, and I didn't know a ton about it. I would just hear little brief things. And then eventually she got hired onto a job with the intent of learning about the job from the inside and then how they could organize from the inside as like a plant. What a, they will term as a salt. Yeah, assault. to be subversive, yes. To be subversive. But the term was, is actually salt. The, 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 the object of this group in terms of you and your friends, what they were doing is when they were trying to get into service industries and push unionization in places that didn't have unions, things like uh, airports, uh, uh, hotels, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, food and beverage, yeah. uh, uh, convention centers, those kinds of things. Um, so they got people to leave their good jobs, like Sarah, to go work at shitty jobs to become secret agent salt. Let me, <laughs> which is Sean's nickname for me. She used to get really <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> Because it, it was it was like it was weird anyway. <laughs> uh, no, but you kind of just jumped ahead. So I just became part of that group where it was like uh, I was very friendly to people. I'd host people and they'd have people from because this is like a, a nationwide group. They'd have conferences. I would host people. I got along with everyone, you know, music interests. And I'm just that kind of person. And the more and more I realized what I was being done was being done, too, is some of the like the, the higher ups were talking to me more and more. Because I was that way, because I'm a person, I'm an affable person, I am a smart person, uh, you know, and, and I care about, I care about, I cared about Baltimore a ton, so I wanted things to be better there, like, you know, so they got all these little clicks, and what they would slowly do is, like, plant little seeds, like, hey, you can make things better for people, so come volunteer, I'd volunteer, and it'd be great, like, nothing too crazy, you never do anything too, too crazy, just, I was never, like, a uh, fucking black face, or not black face, <laughs> black mask, like, throwing things at windows, like, it was not, or, like, uh, defacing property, it would just be, like, you know. But they did organize, they did organize events where they encouraged people to try to get arrested, didn't they? Uh, I was after I left, but yeah. But they did do that, yeah. Yes, yes, and then I, a ton of people I knew did. Anyway. Um, it was, you know, to make a point, whatever, but it was just to literally think about the community around you and like, you know, the conditions of jobs and how you can make it better. And like, what is it enticing about that? Cause I also care about people. So I just kept getting, they call it push just like they did in Nexium and like these other things you call it, you go and push someone. Right. And so I kept getting pushed and then I was just asked one day, like, would you be a salt? I was like, yeah, like, you know, also I was drunk at a party. The more I think about it, I was drunk at a party. <laughs> but then after I said that, it became this thing where, like, uh, one person rolled up and was like, I'm going to meet you for your lunch break today. I had to get in their car, drive around and interview, kind of, and get cleared. And then mm -hmm. the next person came. This is your contact. And you talk to this person and text with this person. Or, like, oh, you're more comfortable talking to this person today? Talk to them. And then eventually it was like I met the the lead person, like you know the the lady that ran it, and got the final put. You know, it was just mm -hmm. like all right, so I did it, and I had to apply to like several jobs, not just where I ended up. Yeah. But several jobs around town that they were trying to like focus on, but what they do is they teach you like interview skills. They'll cater your resume, which actually probably fucked me later on in life, is my resume then got really well catered to service industry jobs. Yeah. I'm very more capable beyond that. But my base and core is now literally catered so well to that. That's where I get the calls, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it's crazy. And they, they take the time to do that. But what I became more involved in and what I cared about was when I, like, volunteered or became, like, a, a first part of this group was, like, I would sit down and actually help people that couldn't fill out a resume, fill out a resume. They were capable of a job. They just didn't have the skills to do that. And I would just help people. But then what I found out was I was helping people get hired onto these target spots. And because I was a contact for this, like, union, later on when that push came to, like, unionize, they would go for it because they helped them get hired there. Mm -hmm. They had that majority voice. But then it just gets even more crazy because, like, there were certain meetings of groups that you were and weren't allowed to. And then you had to, like, break into separate groups and talk. Like, I, I don't even know how to explain it because this is the first time I've really, like, openly air like aired this. Besides well, strong. I mean, as you know. far as I, if I can, I guess contextualize some yes. of it is, um, they are 
purposefully obtuse and they make it like cloak and dagger stuff. Uh, it gives it like an air of importance. It makes you feel like you're really into something like serious and deep. Even though there's really no evidence that these people have actually accomplished anything. It's really more just very self-congratulatory, momentary stuff. I mean, they have uh, helped some leaders go up in a few, um, like, hotels. Like, in, uh, they have a big following in Vegas and stuff, but whatever. Sure. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that they've never, like, accomplished their goals, but I guess it's probably arguable whether or not their presence and their focuses are actually end up being good things that help workers. Uh, yeah, when, no. If you're advocating for people to become part of, like, the most, the largest, most powerful unions in the country that routinely fuck people over. Oh, uh, yeah. Because you no. can go work some place and have to pay union dues, and they will tell you, because this happened to me when I moved uh, to Maryland. I, I worked at, a like, a food delivery warehouse. Like, you know, it was kind of online grocery store stuff, and I worked mm -hmm. there. And awesome. uh, that's what I had met you I had to pay. That. I had to pay 25 bucks a paycheck. And they told me for 90 days they had uh, they could not do anything for me, so I had to pay dues while not benefiting from being in the union. And was most that people from when you were a pipeliner. Uh, and most people, yeah, because the pipeliner, you're immediately you're in the union. No, you're that's why that's a fair clarification. It's what I wanted. Yeah, to I've find. been in two. I've been in two unions. I've been in like the uh, I've been in the food service union, which is like the biggest union in the country. Um, and then I was in the, uh, I can't remember what it's called exactly. I think it's the Pipeliners Union or something like that. I was no, in... it's like the Engineer something union because I found your pins. Yeah, it's it's out of Indiana. And uh, no, that one you're you're in immediately. No, which is immediately, what it's Immediately, it's... immediately you're not, some, they can't just fuck with you. Worker. They can't just fire you. They can't just, doesn't matter if you've been in the union for a day or 10 years. It doesn't matter. But, and I asked the lady because I had to do it when I was going in for like the process of doing my paperwork and you have to do initi like not initiation, but uh, your training and stuff like that. I was like, so I have to pay you and you guys can't do anything for me 90 days. I was like, how does that work? It's like, well, we have a, an agreement with the company. Like, why do you have an agreement with the company? Because they're trying to just use you as you're, a body. And you're supposed away. to be a third party entity. Well, the thing is at a place like that, they burn people out yeah. and they'll fire. They like try to said, fire yeah. people before 90 days. Like that is exactly yeah. the the turnover rate at a place like that is insane. Awful. I was I was part of forty people that got hired mm -hmm. during that cycle, and then two weeks later, there's another thirty people coming in, and like you mm -hmm. know, so it's just always turning around. And there's so many different areas and sections of the like this warehouse that you never knew. I never knew who was being hired on where. Like so, you don't know who's coming and going because the faces are always you or not. Well, the faces <laughs> are always different. You yeah. know, like it could because of uh people just working cross departments or whatever. Like you could work there. I worked there for like probably like two and a half months, three months, right before my like ninety days or whatever. And I had to call out sick and I called the wrong number and then they fired me the next day. Um I left a, a message on the wrong machine. That's so that's how I got fired from people. Wow. <laughs> but you just uh said yeah. the name. I don't care. What I don't give a shit. You Whatever. Pop, you pop, you pop. But that's so it's it's slimy and it's crooked. I mean, so I have my problems with unions in general, and, no, and even I, the even the the engineers union I was in it was very nepotism incestuous, based, yeah. incestuous. Like if they just didn't like you, they were just gonna they would fuck you, and then yeah. didn't really matter. Yeah. But, um, so, okay. but that's but what I'm saying is like uh, so they're at the service at the behest of kind of these giant like corporate entities. Um, the, a union is not some just benevolent force in the world. No. Like, there are good unions, there are bad unions. I think the principle of the union is a positive thing, but to just assume all unions are good and then to try to get people to sign on to the country's biggest union, most wealthy union, um, to line their fucking pockets even more. Yeah. Didn't really I, make sense to me, honestly. And I, and, and I think radicalizing young 20-year-olds... <laughs> Uh, no, to to so, meet look, some sort of nebulous purpose is odd to me. But anyway, sorry. No, I was saying, so what, so what this led into after kind of signing on, I went and got hired onto a job, uh, you know. And what you're told is, so every day you have to call and check in with someone. You're given goals. And then we'll, twice a week we had to meet as a group. You met as a larger group, as a union whole, and then you split off into your teams, which is your location. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you had a cross meet because they would realize, oh, well, Sarah looks kind of sad today. You two have a good rapport. Go talk to her. Or, you know, just things like that. And then, like, every summer they did a kind of thing like they did with the uh, Nexium was 
we had to do like, we, a like company a, retreat, like yeah. a conference retreat. You pick yeah. a city, you'd all That's, travel I mean, to it. Yeah. yeah, and then you'd have workshops that you were developed. You had these intense like calls on, and yeah, then but, but you not... also, yeah. No, well, I was saying ahead. so you did all these kinds of things, but also within my job, I had protocols I had to follow. I got shit about not falling. You're one of them. <laughs> well, this, is, this is what I wanted to get into because there's yeah. this invasion of privacy stuff and this like who you're allowed to communicate with, see what you're allowed to do, this control of your life, calling you at weird times, telling you to come to a meeting in a parking lot, uh, them finding out my home address even though I had nothing to do with any of this stuff. Yep. Uh, so and having your friends come to our my house. To try and find me because I was like, I literally you didn't was answer just, the phone. Yep. Because we were probably banging. <laughs> probably <laughs> balling. At that know. point, probably. But anyway. Not anymore. But back <laughs> then, well, t- probably t- a lot. No, actually, I think we were at a movie. <laughs> Maybe we were at a movie balling. Who knows? We didn't do that. We had to leave a movie once. No, we, we didn't do that. We had to leave a movie once because we were decent, handsy. We're decent fucking people, okay? No, we were getting handsy at a movie and we had to leave. We got handsy at a yeah, James Yeah, but we party. left. We left. <laughs> and then went home. And <laughs> Fell asleep. Not true. Anyway, but Anyway, no. so to me, that is the stuff that is more like the cult stuff, like the more like kind of direct correlation to what well, we're talking what, about. Well, that's what I'm getting into because then even like at that point when I met you, like my roommate stopped me. So, you know. Not to tell again too much about you and I. Like, yeah, our first date, we banged. <laughs> but we'd also worked together for a while. And, you know, we liked each other. It was also your birthday. So, I mean, you're welcome. There you go. But, no, but then the next, like, not the next day, but it was like that next evening, my roommate was like, so are you going to go talk to this person, this person, this person? Like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, because I was just like, whatever, what do you mean? And uh, I was like, well, I think you guys slept together. And I think you have to report that because, you know, the program. They would call it the program, by the way. Because yeah. the, and the I'm lack like, of self awareness well, of people involved in right. this. Right. No. And you know, my, my direct response was like, no. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? You, ha- you have to. I was like, I don't have to tell them shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, you know, because for me, so that's where I started. Like, it, it wasn't just because you, it was like, slightly before you even, I was becoming kind of like disenchanted because it was like, I was already hired under false pretenses, but I'm here doing this work and I'm doing it work for, I'm like actually just getting to know people, right? Like understand what the life is like, like I'm here to like kind of understand this. Um, not to like pat myself on the shoulder, but like if I was making friends with people at work, I was making friends with people at work and if we were going to go hang out, but they would give you goals and they call them socials. Like your goal this week, you've not been as sociable or like we've not reported that you've talked to enough people. You need three socials this week and you need to do one one-on-one and you need to do like, and it was like that. And then you get put in a room with one person, like in an office and they would be yeah, like, because so if you don't that... need your three socials, if you don't do this da, 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 and then report back to me. So you're you supposed to tell them every fucking detail. Which I never did. I told them things that would which... be helpful life-wise. Like, well, I hung out with this person and it's like, you know, they're having like trouble buying groceries this week and they've got five kids. So that's the kind of things we need to target. For me, it was like more interpersonal. It wasn't about like protocols and like reporting, but you were pulled into offices or like literally I would get told like, oh, this person was give you a ride to work today. Okay. Which for me at that point, okay, cool. And then the whole car was like a car ride to the work was a drill. Like this, this, and this, or I'd be asked, like, about something I enjoyed very much, like, philosophy, or, like, uh, art, or whatever, and then it got trying to, like, well, this is how you need to apply this, this, and this, and I'll call you later. Yeah, and because, I mean, they're trying to, it's, you know, it's, it's not, like, well, they're just trying to get deeper into your life <clears throat> in terms of, like, your personal interests, and they try to relate it to the things also, that yeah. you're another, doing for them. Like, another last straw, my cat, I love very much, died, tragically, in my apartment, swallowed a mouse whole, had to, like, cremate him, and that day, I was like, I don't want to talk to anyone. You know, I was just like, oh, fuck this. They showed up at my door and banged on my door to, like, open the door. And they're like, you need to go for a walk. I think that'll clear your mind. I'm here. I'm your friend. And I was like, okay, dude. You know, whatever. So we walked. And then it became about how I'm ignoring the program. And I need to focus right now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I fucking just burned my cat today. You know? <laughs> well, I didn't do it. The, the vet did it. But you know what I mean? It was just yeah. like. 
why do I have to report to you like who I'm, you know, and then I also personally for myself at this point in my life, I was fucking, we're all wild, like partying, house parties, end up in a circumstance through like I was told to go on a social because there's a big work party, had one of the worst experiences, like a very traumatic, like sexual experience happened to me, brought it up to a few people. I was like, dude, this was fucked up. No one cared about that. They cared about like, well, what did you learn about the targets you were supposed to talk to that night? And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that's like really that. weird happened to me, you know. And it was yeah. just like that's where you sort of like. So that's kind of where you when you want to talk about next to bring back in what we're actually supposed to be talking about is like, what is it that makes people click out of this cloud where you think you're doing good for not just yourself but other people or whatever it is? Well, I think everybody has a threshold, right? And if you go too fast too soon. Yeah. Uh, like there will always, because there's always an escalation, and for some people, it's just not incremental enough. I think on a long enough timeline, you can get anybody. Honestly. Yeah. No. Honestly, you can get anybody. Uh, you have to just make them think they want it, and that's kind of what the you know, what you're involved in, what the people in Nexium are involved in with any group of people. It is about that. Anytime you want to get people to do something for you, even in businesses. Like, you know, I've worked for a lot of small businesses. Uh, a lot of times, if you have somebody that's smart, a smart, like, owner of a business, you might work with them directly because it's so, the company's so small. They want you to feel like you're part of the family, like that you yeah. have a stake in this, that you are invested in this. I'm sure you work for a, a smaller company, but also not the smallest in the world. But th that's what it's always about. It's always yeah. about, like... How important you are to the community. How important you are yeah. to the to to like your coworkers. Like the whether or not you're actually getting anything positive out of it, it doesn't matter. But they're trying to reach the same part inside of you. Yeah, they're, they're trying to touch that same thing. They're placating a lot of your like senses. Yeah, it's and especially if you're already a person that's kind of geared to be helpful or you're geared to uh, be empathetic, that is easy to take advantage of. It just is. Because you're just going to have a higher sense of responsibility no matter what you're doing. Um, like, I, I found myself, I worked some shitty jobs, and that was always in that position. Because for some reason, I just had a sense of responsibility, and I was like, somebody has to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would end up doing twice the work, constantly. <laughs> just like <Hey>. you. <laughs> um, and well, that's was, why I would... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, but it's something that, like, you know, I always fought against because there were times in my life that I would be like, no, fuck you, that's not my job. Like, fuck I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And, I, and then I would just feel bad. Well, and that was the thing about... I would feel about... bad because I just had to tell somebody off. I know that this person is tired and they're trying to just get things done, but they are, it is not my responsibility, and I know that once you set a precedent, it becomes your responsibility. Like, I know this. I've worked enough places that I know right. that. Right, right. And uh, well, but I always struggled with that. I always, I still to this day struggle with stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. No, and then for me too, it's like uh, you know I'm the same way. I I will. I'm always a person that I, I I think I'm smart. I don't I don't know if anyone agrees. You know, I think I'm a smart person. I'm very capable. I'm very willing. So I always always just do what I what needs to be done. I'll just do it till it's done well. And um, that was the other problem with like you know that job I was working at that last job. You know, was like. I immediately, they were like, you need to have management. Like, you need to be in management. Mm -hmm. And I was like, awesome. So you're not going to pay me seven twenty five an hour? You'll pay me $10 an hour? Literally, I dropped myself down to seven twenty five an hour yeah. shortly after college. <laughs> Graduate with great grades and chances of grad school. Great job, Sarah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. but I did this with good intention, right? Because I am very much like a... I, I like people, you know. Well, I you just thought, like everyone. yeah, you get caught up in the in the moment. You get caught up in a maelstrom of things, and before you know it, you're like, oh fuck, I'm destroying my life. Yeah, uh, I'm for, still to the kind of, ramifications of that. But anyway. Ramifications of it. I mean, I think you've you've bounced back pretty well, but it's you know, it no. takes a long time. Once you get off track a little bit, sometimes it just takes a long way to get back to. Oh, you know? dude, yeah, I ruined my credit. I ruined. I couldn't pay student loans. Anyway, let me just finish what I was saying. It was like, I literally had to have a three meetings about getting promoted to shift supervisor, which, you know, we, you had the same position as me. It's not I, that big I of a did deal. after working there for about two weeks. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, but it's not that. I'm big just that deal. fucking top tier. 
<laughs> you are. No, but you get what I'm saying. It's I was like a sucker. That's what I was. It's also not really that big of a deal. <laughs> like you just make sure shit's clean and you leave. No, you fucking got it. You know what? No, actually, no. You get paid. No, you got fucked in your drawer. <laughs> you get you, you get paid incrementally more, and you are uh, you are a scapegoat. No, but actually, what happened to you was against the law. And that was one thing that, except another, th- you know, I like labor oh. law. Like, that's why. I was so do, of course, so do I. Yeah. Like this is the this is the thing. Like, I, I I don't have a problem with unions, and like, and I can understand you uh, being in the position, like, oh, you know, I'm going to try to do something subversive to help people, right? Right. Uh, there's a lot of shitty people that work at these places. They're apathetic. They don't really care. They're predatory. Ooh, I got um, one fired. <laughs> but I don't. But I also don't think uh, that necessarily like. Uh, what you were involved with is actually a sal for that. I don't know if that no. really. It's just like you're gonna just shift abusers mm-hmm. to a certain extent, and like I didn't. I don't find it to be like that fruitful of a venture. And maybe that's just because I had dealt with them like you know, a few months prior to that. Um, well, it was a different group. But though. I was never invited. In, I was never into invited into the secret commie society. I don't know why. Well. I don't know what's wrong with me. I guess no. I wasn't good enough. No, it was me. <laughs> I guess I talked too much about fucking Deftones yeah. or something. I don't know. <laughs> no. I don't no. know why I said the Deftones. <laughs> you know, because you watched it change. Um, yeah, in the House of Commies. <laughs> no, actually, that was because of me. Because I when so when they were like, "Oh, yeah, you can you can date this guy at work," and I was like, "Oh, can I?" Because I'm going to do it anyway. Um, they asked me, "They're like, is he like? Would he be pro union?" Is he, could he be a target? Could we talk to him? I went, no. He hates unions. <laughs> I said that. I straight up in a meeting with three people. I was like, nope. And they were like, then why? Why do you like him? And I was like, because he, he likes he, the Deftones. Right? <laughs> no, it, for me, it was like, because he makes me laugh. Like, See, you know, I, I wish so scared. much. Yeah, I wish I wish they would have came for me. They were. I, I, you know what I would have you know I I been, Sarah? Them. I would have I been a salt. I would have been like a double agent. <laughs> I would have got in, and then I would have went immediately to the people, those fucking dirtbags that were like the, that ran the place we worked, and I would have told them. Do you? Ever- I'd be like, I'd be like, fifty percent of the people that work for you guys are all plants. They're all no, plants. All these college I, kids. There was two of us. I would have told them. I wouldn't care. I would have lied. You would have told Cause everyone because you guys because you guys were there to recruit. You're not. The, see, the job hadn't been done yet. You were no, the it was there more so than you know because so the story. Oh, I can't get in. Uh, yeah, you can get it. Why not? You just don't use names. Whatever. Uh, so it was at the airport, and uh, notoriously that airport. Actually, this is another selling point for me. So notoriously, the airport used to be Friendship Airport, and it was a state property. It still is a state property. And back in the day, it was uh, mandated that a certain amount of local businesses had to operate their restaurants and uh, merchandising things. And it was a lot of small families. And then slowly over time, Sky Mall came in. And Sky Mall is a big corporation. Mm-hmm. And they also have the buying and legal power to go in and buy the entire property and run it however the fuck they want. But it's also an umbrella. So it's Sky Mall and then mm-hmm. it's small subsidiaries under it. Yeah. So the more you learn about it is it's not actually a state facility, even though every person that works there, it should technically be a state covered and mandated job because it is a state owned and funded. Yeah, but SkyMall Sky Mall pays the state to be there, sir. They pay right, them. But SkyMall is able to do, even through the way they lease things. They pay uh, rent. They, no, listen to me. But the way the rent and the leasing happens with these companies is laws with, like, pay and breaks. So a lot of labor laws get kind of muddy because it's under, like, this corporate umbrella. It is. I it's not think... unlike a state facility. You don't get the state benefits, which is no. actually what should be happening. You don't get the state benefits because you're not technically working for you're not working for the state. SkyMall is working for the state, and they get to make the decision, and the state has allowed them to do that. Right, and so that's the bigger problem. And so when that, but if SkyMall's not there, McDonald's isn't there. If SkyMall's not there, the place we worked well, isn't then, there. Then, but they're also going against the original agreements where it was like all these local businesses and restaurants. Hey, I'm not disagreeing with you on that. No, fact. I'm just saying yeah. so that kind of shit hit my heartstrings. I'm like, yeah, all right. But that's a know. state. But it's like that's a state issue. You have to go I after mean, the state. Do I? Do I do. No, but this is what I'm like. Listen, this. Hold on. <laughs> before you continue, this is what I'm saying. This is what is so gross about what the, what this group was doing. They're trying to tell you that no, we don't need to get rid of Sky Mall. 
We don't need no, to appeal to this. No, we don't what? Need, no, we don't need to appeal to that. We need to get unionization. And SkyMall is still going to fucking be there. It's not about that, Sarah. Like, that's well, not what that was no, about. No, the, the, what they do is they get you out there's power, numbers, power in the voice, and then... <laughs> you have to appeal to the state to change its mind. SkyMall, what the fuck is... SkyMall is taking an opportunity... You have to show enough... To you have to show enough distress and egregious uh, faults and all these things to the state. So you were just literally trying to build cases to take it to the state, which was happening, actually. They actually had two things go. We were actually a part of a class action lawsuit, me and you. We just never yeah, followed through. Yeah, that never went anywhere. Come on. It did. I did. We the didn't do the is not, Why not Why would the state, especially because that of state... Because of people like you that had their till shortage, yeah, shorted, but, no, I'm and not, then they took out your paycheck, no, which is illegal. Yeah, but what I'm saying is what you're fighting against is like the state. So why would the state give a fuck? The state gets rich off of enough, Sky Mall being there. Because there's enough inc incidents of, um, there's actually a lot of like injury cases, like all these things. And it's just, you know, those things there's are, enough. Those things are impossible to prove. And okay. oftentimes they just get completely. You can go ahead and bring all this documentation. But if you document enough through like several class action lawsuits through all the companies, like for some, like you, you were a part of that because it was such a wage discrepancy and issue just in our one smaller company. So not even SkyMall, this company. Mm -hmm. And if you put enough like push through that, that actually could be like issues. And it's not even about your political affiliation, it's literally about your ethics for. The treatment of people, you know. I so understand. That, I understand that, but like, I, I'm the fucking pit bull about that stuff. So I got that fucking manager fired. Like, I don't, yeah, well, it's because that guy was a creep. I mean, that's not even that has nothing to do. With... Say anything, they would just laugh like, "Oh, that's that greasy Greek again," <laughs> you know. Hey, hey now. Oh, and I fucking had his job. In, Greeks had his job in a week. Oh my goodness. The shit he said to me. Come on, you remember? No, I, I, I'm joking. Like, yeah, <laughs> obviously. No, nobody should go to work and feel that way. No, I mean that place. I mean that's Baltimore. It's full of fucking dirtbags. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh uh, you know what? I I'm very comfortable saying ninety percent of the people that I worked with there were fucking scum of the earth. Oh, I would never love, love speak to them. Whistle. I would never <laughs> speak to them in any other context. Never. Never no, in my fucking I mean, life. No. I felt so low as a human being working at that airport. And then you found the love of your life. And I found the love of my life. Uh, Creep status confirmed everywhere I looked. So you're just saying I'm disgusting? Is that what you're saying? Well, you are from Baltimore. So <laughs> can't be helped. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I don't know, maybe we disagree a little bit on, I guess, the function or the, the goals or something like that. I, I don't think no, those no, things no, no, actually... No. I think the end result is exactly that. I'm just saying, like... The idea of it and the uh, but this but, this, but that group is not bringing these class action lawsuits. These are that was one no, of the weird did. things. The one we got sent mail about was yes, that was them. Those yeah. are lawyers. I know that. I thought that was not the case. No, it was the case. And I'm pretty sure that case went nowhere because you cannot <laughs> prove those things. I uh, people can have grievances. You can go no, sign an affidavit saying like, "Hey, he treated me like shit," or no, "I got fired." Your issue was you didn't save the pay stub that had that discrepancy. Oh, maybe, but there's no way to there was no way to prove it, sir. There's no way like for me to go back and actually provide evidence. The pay stub, even that, would not be enough in a court of law. No, but you had you had me and probably three other people that actually left that job because that it, fucking crackhead took money. <laughs> you know, that, whatever. I know, but that doesn't even <laughs> even that doesn't matter because they didn't have cameras. They don't have any of this shit. They have no documentation for anything. You could rip that place off, fucking. Left, right, and center. Just like I that dude was day. doing. <laughs> Just like that dude was doing. I know I got a lot of free sodas. No, see, what I did was I made friends with everyone else in the airport, also part of my goals, but then I actually genuinely liked people. And so one day, someone from, like, the sushi place that opened across the way, they like, you want some salmon rolls? I'm like, you know it, what you want. Some mm -hmm. strombolis? Okay, you got some strombolis. <laughs> yeah, so I had, like, a black market trade going on in the airport. Yeah. We're like, oh, you the, slipped me a beer? I got you. underground bullshit, yeah. <laughs> I ate well. <laughs> or we had fried too many wings that day. <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot of wings. A lot of pizza and wings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Running out of that place. Uh, My favorite thing, because Sean would run the shift after me, because we were both shift leads, and he always come in after me, and he'd be like, why the fuck does this table look this way? And I'd be like... Did you get here at 5 a.m. after being up with you all night? No. 
How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? But it's yeah. Truth. What the fuck? <laughs> All right, I, dude. I never ever would say that to you. You're so full of shit. I would never ever say like in a serious tone. No. I would never be like, what the fuck? Because I really didn't oh, care. No, I know. So I'm just saying I it really didn't care. And then we got yelled at because we leave secret messages to each other on the, the pizza board because then we had like a super manager that went to like a week of training. I went to pizza school. <laughs> you remember that guy? My favorite thing is that guy was so ineffectual that he came back from that training. He's like, here, let me show you what I learned. Let me show you how we actually are supposed to make pizzas. And he showed me and he just looked and I'm just like kind of like half paying attention. He's like, you're probably not going to do this. Huh? I was like, no. <laughs> No, right. <laughs> I'm just gonna do like, it. I had a Wait, I know how to do it quickly. He had a meltdown because we had like a communication, like online communication board, and so one day I used it to communicate between shifts. I'm like, this place was left fucking trash this morning. Everything everywhere. Please let's work on that. You are taking me out of the equation. I am the boss. And I was like, are you, Mr. Box Haircut? <laughs> Sweating all the time. <laughs> uh, I mean, you got to feel bad for a dude like that because that's just like you don't know what you're getting into. But he was not involved at all. Right. Like, he just wasn't – if he had been more involved and hands-on, like, then he would have had control. But he he wanted no, to that pay check company and... was literally about bro dudes hanging out in power positions and fucking their bartenders till they became, like, not shift leads but, like, the supervisors. But you remember who I'm talking about. Hell, yeah. No, oh, sure. yeah, well, that's what they all did. They literally ran a train on that one girl that wandered around with the blonde hair. Yeah. The manager <laughs> girl? Party. Hmm? <laughs> uh, the manager girl? Yeah. Uh, the one the... that was married? The new, yeah. The new mm-hmm. girl? Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The other two, the the boat, the other two like, main managers ran a train Anyway, <laughs> is, that a, is that a train if it's only two people? Well, there's also the crackhead guy was there as well. <laughs> not not lying, like was that the Christmas? Well, did he, yeah, he maybe he saw it. Mm. <laughs> he was just jerking off in the corner. The corner, right? yeah. yeah, whatever. No, but seriously, like that's like, that's that. that's how like that's the, like You like the biggins, dude. It was funny, like he was a uh, like literally <laughs> like maybe a hundred and twenty pounds soaking wet. And I'm not saying this to be derogatory. <laughs> to be, Let's just talk about that. <laughs> but he like he like bigger girls, like bigger black chicks. This booty. was this was like this <laughs> dude was like a it's Florida trash. He's back in Florida. <laughs> I'm sure he is. But anyways, but he liked big, like big black girls. Like I'm not talking about like oh a little thickness. I'm talking like maybe 350 pounds. You know who I'm talking about. No, I turtle. <laughs> no, not turtle. Same oh, name yeah. as turtle. But, yeah, I got you. <laughs> but uh, the young girl, I always felt bad for. Her. I was always trying to help I her and give her like, it. just fucking stop. What are you doing? Oh, yeah. Anyways, trying to we're help so her. we're so fucking off track. <laughs> oh, you trying to help her? <laughs> no, I was just like she was killing herself. It was stupid. Anyways, no shit. I know she'd sleep at the fucking airport so she could play WoW. Sean. I what? used to sleep at the airport so I could not take buses and trains. Can we talk no, about that? Because that's a I know that. the well, conditions sh- of that no, working she, environment. She was in so, the same. She was in the same yeah. position as you. Like where it's so hard. Like if, even if you live in the city to get to the airport, yes. you actually had. It was actually like a Herculean effort if you didn't want to spend thirty bucks in a cab. So, so let me talk about that because I. So I lived downtown and I did for a while. Uh, and from where I lived, the apartment you knew me in. Uh, to get to the airport on time, I either had to go to the bus stop by 2 to catch a bus by 2.30 and then catch a second connection bus to get there by 4. And uh, literally the airport from downtown Baltimore is like not even 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. So I would have to leave for my 4 o'clock clock in, 4.15 clock in at 2.30 in the morning and the bars are closing at 2.00. But also, or you had to, like, find the specific trains, pay more of a train fee, but then you also had to transfer on trains to a shuttle. It was it's very complicated. And that was another thing that, like, I was, like, kind of, like, played to and preyed upon because also at that point I didn't actually have a car because I was like, oh, I'm partying. Why do I have to pay for insurance when I have a license? Yeah. <laughs> license gets me to the bar. But, you know, I'm just saying, like, uh, they had to, like, think about people who that's their day-to-day. And they got kids they got to get to school and all these things. And 
there's not a streamlined service that provides transportation to these jobs that should be there because it is a state facility. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And then also because they can't afford internet, she would do that. She was, a, she's actually a really nice, sweet girl. A very nice yeah. person that got was dumb, young and dumb. Well, um, or like, uh, like whatever. Okay. I, I, no. I didn't, I'm just saying, like, I just felt bad for it. Yeah, you get into these human parts of it where it's like... I would not try to turn her into a communist. I would not do that to her. It's not... Sarah, when you were out there trying to turn people into communists, how do you live with yourself? I feel like back on election night on this podcast just being called a communist when I'm not a communist. You can call me a troll next. No, No, I say uh, (laughs) Sarah is a, what I call you, a secret socialist. (laughs) Mm. No. It's it's really, it's, it's tough, guys. It's tough. But anyways, uh, let's bring it back to Nexium. Okay. <laughs> We've talked. That was her. a juicy. That was a juicy conversation, though. Yeah, it's a fun conversation, and, and it relates to Nexium in the sense that that's how you get involved in these things. Just like I was talking about this girl that like I felt really bad for, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you meet people like that that you want to help, and like especially if you think you're involved in something that is helpful, uh, why so wouldn't you, you want to introduce? Th- why wouldn't you want to introduce them to that? Like, why mm. wouldn't you want to empower them in that way? Be like, I have this thing that's helped me so much. It's given me so much power. It's been the salve for all my problems. And I think a lot of people look at things like Nexium or uh, communist cults, communist political cults. Uh, no, but just like Nexium, like I said, gurus, Tony Robbins, Jordan Peterson, they look at that stuff because they're looking for direction. They're looking for help because uh, they feel lost. And... I do. I, I understand like how people. I'm just happy in some ways that I'm just so, so full of hate and cynicism that it's really hard to get me to care about anything. <laughs> just, just through this. <laughs> no. Well, I just don't. I don't. I don't. Maybe it's just because when I grew up at a young age, like I was in my parents, I was involved in like a mild religious cult. I'd call it. Yeah. So I got to see that stuff when I was young, and I saw the manipulation. I saw also the I saw the negative side of it. I saw that when what happens when you don't conform. I saw people backstab and turn their backs, and I think that had an effect on me when I was really young. So I just am very cynical about the intentions of like right. groups, groups that it, like purport yeah. to help you with something or give you advice or do whatever. So having that experience at a young age, I think, has just made me. Uh, pretty resilient to that stuff but even i i had a time in my life when i was like really low uh like i will say this like whether or not i like the self-help version of jordan peterson uh Mm -hmm. just back when he first kind of became a thing a lot of valuable stuff really kind of helped me it was the beginning of me kind of like uh redirecting myself a little bit for sure 100 percent helped me recontextualize my life in a weird way Hmm. I'm not going to join his cult, but you know, especially because now it's just going to be Michaela telling me. Like I meat. said, that's why I, I brought that up earlier. Just eat the meat. The meat queen. Eat yeah. the meat. I love that. It was at uh, Red Bar Radio. The meat queen. <laughs> he, hits the, he hits the blow up button. Yeah, he hits that blow up button a little too much. <laughs> no, I think it's perfect. No, there's some episodes though. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I I like Red Bar. I do. Like I. I don't I know like... why I wouldn't say that out loud, but okay. I don't like. Why? Red What's Bar. happened what recently? About? What's happened recently? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um. But there but are sometimes yeah. those sat that soundboard. You're like, oh god damn it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So. Um, in closing, I suppose we sort of kind of wrap things up. So, which one of the Nexium documentaries did you like better? India truncated title. <laughs> the seduce, seduce inside Nexium cult. Yeah. Did you think though it was in a weird way? It was like India didn't do anything wrong. The documentary. She's a victim. Um, the documentary. <laughs> actually, I did not agree with you on that until you read to me the. Um, the kind of blurb about it that you'd read before the summary, because it does mention her implications in the cult in the summary. But then when you watch the actual documentary, it's the kind of clearer name. Dist- a it's bit. trying to distance her. It is. So, it is. 100%. No, so what I'm saying. So just when you just watch it and don't read that summary, it's kind of like, 
that's not in my mind. I was just watching it and it's her journey through it. But then you reading that summary and the conversations we've had, it's kind of like, yeah, it's a little divisive. Well, because it's kind of an expose <laughs> piece that is just in her to her benefit. And I yeah. think it's something that is literally orchestrated by her mother. Catherine Oxenberg is very involved. I no, mean, she... all know it's her princess mother, the princess of Yugoslavia. <laughs> I know it's so it's so crazy. But like Remember I, just, I asked you, I was like, "What do you do in Yugoslavia?" Like, but you know, it's, it's it's weird. Like I felt her presence. Like she's very she's in the vow a lot. Like and she's a controlling presence in the vow. She directs. You think she a was lot. like. She directs a lot here, of well. She directs know, just, a lot of the arc of what happens. She's the one that's pushing for all this shit. She's the one hiring the private investigators and talking to what's that guy's name, Paul Sitaro, whatever his name. Yeah, is. but so, doing what's is it? What's doing what's necessary though to get that break? Or are they perform? Is this all an act? I think part of it, like you know, let's listen. These are these are rich, famous actors. Oh, Frank Parlato, the Parlato Report, or whatever. She hires yeah. that dude. Like she's hey, the one that does all that. Talk stuff. about the Parlato report, though. Just, um, sh- 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 so I think some of it is performative. You got to remember, these are all like the people that are focused on, not necessarily in seduce, and which is why, in my opinion, I think seduce has a slight edge because it's more succinct, but basically tells the same story. Yeah. Um, these are all actors, and these are all like creatives, and they have a way of engendering the sympathy with an audience. They know how to do it. They are able to click into it. That's why it's so interesting to watch after post the documentary. They are becoming celebrities because of this documentary. Like, they're all C-tier actors, directors, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Mark Vicente maybe had... He probably could have had a more pronounced career. I mean, What the Bleep Is It was actually a pretty kind of zeitgeisty thing. Yeah, no, 100% he probably, everywhere. If he wasn't giving all of his time to fucking next him, he probably would have been okay. Um, right. But there is, like, this weird... Uh, well, can I ask you something? What? what if this is all another ruse, and then we, like, hear Keith talk? We've all been brought in now to Nexium. <laughs> yeah, we're all... The entire world is just part of Nexium. Right, because we're all now listening to Keith, and then Keith's going to talk to us. <laughs> Listen, yeah, my mom... Come on. My mom, <laughs> I would not be I, great. I, I, wanna, I want stuff. I want to see like all of, I want to see like 30 hours of raw footage of Keith and Keith Raniere. Like I want to see that. Like I oh like my. because I need you listen, on his walks when he's just walking I cannot, around. Walk, I cannot like, fucking stand when people uh turn villains into abstractions, cartoon characters. It makes me think you're hiding something. And it's not because I think that they're ultimately they're going to prove like their thesis wrong or whatever. But the most important thing that you can get out of things like this, and maybe most people can just from what's already been presented, is like how and why this happens, how and why a person wants this. That's why it's so important to go like watch like like uh, Manson interviews or no, or actually yeah. one of the most compelling things. And I I'm. I'm going to do a rewatch of it probably on uh, one of the live streams. Can you bring me? Oh, wait. Oh, I don't want to be on live stream. Anyway. <laughs> um, is uh, the Bjork soccer. The oh. guy filmed for 18, there's 18 hours of footage. And <laughs> you actually can watch somebody develop a pathology and go crazy. Sean, like, I, will be on, I will be on that live stream. <laughs> but that is something that is like. I'm never allowed that, on the like, live stream. <laughs> You'll never find something that is such a unique opportunity to literally look inside the soul of a person. And I bet mm-hmm. you there is there's so much footage of Keith Raniere you could do the same thing with. Like I want to understand well, why what, like why that on, works. When he's on his like, you know, I'm talking about he would go on his like. Uh, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. There's tons of audio recordings. There's tons of video footage. There's private moments. There's films. Like there's planned film moments. Like. All those things are very revealing about a person, and um, I do. If I do have a complaint about both of the documentaries, is that it is a caricature, obviously yeah. of a real of a real person that probably is not a great person, um, but it is caricature esque, and it. And when I'm a uh, as an adult, I feel condescended to a little bit. I'm like, but so we'll see what happens in the Vow season two. <laughs> Which I don't know if they're going to focus on Ranieri because I feel like they're going to it's going to be split between like post the vow coming out and then like interviews with Ranieri. 
Um, you know, that's I, I mentioned in the beginning, but like Scott Adams interviewing that uh, the girl from Battlestar Galactica. Mm. Uh, she played Callie. Oh. Um, it's interesting to see because there is like this uh, forced casualness about dismiss- dismissing what happened. It does seem like she's a little bit in a in a cult, but you don't actually learn a lot from it, which was kind of disappointing. But it's just very saying no, no. But it's also fair to mention see. she leads the group. There is a group that is currently dancing outside of the view of his they, prison cell. They did that. They do performative yeah. dance, and she they, is the lead of that group. And she's also legally married to Allison Mack. Yeah, which was a thing to get her green green card, basically. Right, but well, so no. alleged. No, it's not for love. It's not for love. Yeah, I, it's for love. <laughs> Allison no, Max like, yeah, I'll marry you. I fuck Keith still anyway. Perf- huh? Allison Max like, yeah, I'll marry you. I mean, get my D, my vitamin D from Keith. Keith <laughs> Renary. Any no, but um, no, but there's still a group that dances performably, like they are doing the Vanguard birthday celebration. Yeah, but do they still do that? Yeah, they just get the footage of that doing that one time. Yeah, they still do it. There are still people like going up. Or at least standing outside so he can see. Where is, it? Where is he in jail? Let's go. California. Actually, I would do that just to be like a spectator. Keith Raniere! I'd be like, mm-hmm. I, I present myself to you. I actually, I'm very excited. This is going to sound so stupid. So I really like True Crime Docs too. But for me, I really like cult stuff. Also, probably is my personal experience. But it is very interesting. There is a Heaven's Gate one coming out. That's true. That'd be really cool. And what's wrong? Oh, the dog's uh, bothering you. Yeah, you know, the dog's like in a bag. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Heaven's Gate one is the new HBO one. It actually drops on uh, December 4th, so Friday. They're dropping all four episodes on the same day, too. Then, well, wait. Can we get our kid to go away on Saturday and we just watch it? <laughs> yeah, so maybe next, next time. Actually, no. Next time Sarah and I get together, maybe we'll talk about that. But we also have on the docket... It might not be until uh, sometime in January. We're going to do The Great Gatsby. I'm going to read the book. We're going to watch both of the movies. Uh, the... That's why you asked me to do The Great Gatsby? Because, uh, yeah, go ahead. He is my number one favorite author ever. Sorry. <laughs> so Sarah is. will have uh, you know, some interesting insights into the books and the adaptations, so I thought she would be a great partner to do that with. Um, also, Baz Luhrmann, he's fine. Well, we're gonna find out. You know, we have not. We actually we bought it like five years ago. We saw it when it came out. We have not actually watched it since we bought it. So I'm gonna we'll, make you sound sweet. You bought it for me as a gift, so thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was the Black Friday thing. It was like five bucks, right? I feel like that it was. I'm good on the Black Friday stuff. You took me to the theater too, so thank you. <laughs> we did. We saw it in 3D, as intended. Mm-hmm. Um. So we're going to talk about, yeah, the Boz Lerman one. Also, I don't know who the director is, but the 1974 one Can with Robert Redford. Name the, yeah, Robert Redford and... and uh, Sinatra's wife. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I've never seen it. I've never what? Seen You've it. never seen the old Great Gatsby movie? No, I own, I own it. I got it because... You've never seen it? That's what you just I, said. No, I never have. No, I bought it because of you, like a few months ago. What are we doing, you fool? <laughs> I've been waiting for a, a time, so that's why that's why you buy things. So you put it on the shelf. You say like, "Oh, it's time." I'm excited because I like I love Fitzgerald's story, his life, and his short stories. Like, uh, and then Sean had said someone had brought it to the uh, chat the other night, so I'm pretty. I yeah, got um, so stoked, like. Uh, that is an author. I found his grave in Maryland and went to it. <laughs> one, of, one, of our, one of our international fans, Maverick, uh, oh. requested that we do that. Well, actually, he just requested that I review them. And I was like, oh, because I know you and I know your affinity for Fitzgerald. And I know that you or know that story very well. I was like, oh, that would be a great person to actually just do a full, like, long form spoiler cast about it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It'd be cool. All right. Well, do you have any uh, last words about uh, Nexium cult life, anything like that? Don't drink the Kool Aid. Don't do it, everybody. Don't do it. Be Actually, like, I know. was told the other day that's not a funny joke. Why? Because it killed because millions. Of it killed tons of people. And, da, 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 da. and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> well, right. Diabetes kills, kids. Diabetes kills. 
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to know more about Zoobox, there's a bunch of links in the description for Facebook, for Instagram, for my Twitter, for my brother Dan's Twitter. Uh, also, Twitch. Go to my Twitch page and follow it. I'm going to be doing some uh, live movie watches. So if we can get enough people, we can use Amazon Prime. We can watch movies on there. No, I don't have to worry about any type of copyright stuff. So there you go. Also, if you'd like to make a recommendation, but just like we were just talking about, The Great Gatsby, if you'd like to make a recommendation for a daily movie, or like a quick movie review, or something for the big show, for Zoobox Goes to the Movies, leave it in the comments, and we'll put it on the list. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. You're welcome. I will see you in 10 seconds. Nope. Goodbye. Goodbye. Invincible skin. It's hard.